afternoon, everybody. I'm Carla Millette. I am director of the Center for European Studies. Um, I'd like to welcome you. Um, I'd like to send out a special warm welcome to our honored guest, uh, Petr Pithart, uh, senator and former prime minister of the Czech Republic, who's able to join us today. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you all warmly to the final uh, CES event of this semester, Jewish Music in the Time of the Holocaust. This event was planned in collaboration with the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies and the Frankel Center for Judaic Studies, and in recognition of the National Days of Remembrance, and finally as an accompaniment to the performance tonight at the University Musical Society uh, by the Pavel Haas Quartet. The Conversations on Europe series, this is the last of these this semester, this year. It's sponsored by the Center for European Studies and is our signature lecture series on modern Europe and the European Union at the University of Michigan. Um, the Conversations on Europe lectures feature prominent scholars and artists from the University of Michigan, from throughout the United States, and from Europe. Um, and they are often produced in collaboration between the Center for European Studies and its partner centers, uh, the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, uh, the Wiser Center on Emerging Democracies, and the Wiser Center on uh, um, European studies. For its end of semester luncheons and programs, the, semester, the center traditionally taps local expertise to investigate unique talk, topics in a thoughtful and broad discussion on Europe's past, present, and future. Um, you may be wondering when the luncheon part of the event starts. Mm -hmm. That will follow the, the uh, lecture and performances today. Now, we're going to have a series of lectures, presentations, and performances um, by four scholars and performing artists. I'm going to introduce them very, very quick, quickly. These are abbreviated uh, biographies um, you know, in order to save time. Um, and I'm going to introduce them in the order in which you'll see them here at the podium. Uh, just to, to help you remember to put names to faces. Um, first, Timothy Cheek is Associate Professor of Performing Arts at the University of Michigan and an Associate Faculty Member of the University's um, Center for Russian and East European Studies. Professor Cheek has performed recitals as a collaborative pianist in 15 countries on four continents. His books are recognized internationally as authoritative resources for singing in Czech. Among them, um, Singing in Czech, A Guide to Czech Lyric and Diction and Vocal Repertoire, a series on Janacek's, uh, he's also author of a series on Janacek's opera La Libretti and a book on Smetana's The Bartered Bride. His CD of the songs of Kapralova with uh, soprano Dana Boreshova was nominated for the best Czech recording of 2003 by Harmonia, a leading Czech periodical, and I apologize for slaughtering the pronunciation of all of those Czech names. <laughs> um, Second, <clears throat> Alan Schrott, bass baritone, is a versatile performer noted especially for his commitment to new and undiscovered music. He sang the American premieres of Thomas Addis's opera Powder Her Face and Mark Antony Turnage's Greek. And he was featured on the world premiere recording of the former Detroit Symphony Orchestra conductor Paul Paré's two French cantatas, Yanitza and Assis et Galate. He has appeared in roles with the Michigan Opera Theater the Toledo Opera, the Opera Boston, Opera Maine, and the Aspen Opera Theater. Uh, uh, and in concert with the Toledo Symphony, the Grand Rapids Symphony, the Aspen Chamber Orchestra, the Illinois Symphony, and numerous other concert organizations in the Detroit area. Third, Caroline Hilton, soprano, uh, is a clinical assistant professor of music, uh, voice, and also, also an associate of the University of Michigan's Frankel Center for Judaic Studies. Her diverse performance credits include Voices of the Holocaust, performed live with, uh, on Chicago's classical music radio station WFMT with pianist Catherine Goodson, whom we'll also hear from today, the New York premiere of Paul Schoenford's uh, uh, Ghetto Songs, Joseph uh, Schwantner's Wild Angels of the Open Hill, with the Brave New Works Ensemble, and Ginastra's Cantata para America Magica with the U of M uh, Percussion Ensemble. She has also appeared numerous times with the Bach Dancing and Dynamite Society, um, a group founded by pianist Jeff Sykes and flutist uh, Stephanie Jute in Madison, Wisconsin. And finally, Catherine Goodson, who has appeared in recital throughout the United States, uh, Europe, and Japan with leading wind instrumental and vocal artists. At the University of Michigan, 
Michigan School of Music. She served as a collaborative pianist coach and as musical director for Robert Swedberg's uh, op uh, opera studio. She has collaborated with Caroline Helton on Voices of the Holocaust and has taught classes at Stanford at the Conservatoire de Genève and at the Musashino Music School in Tokyo. She has also taught American art song at the Karlsruhe uh, Music School in Germany and has worked as an artistic director in Stuttgart for the International Hugo Wolf Academy in Ann Arbor for two Charles Ives festivals with the Phoenix Ensemble and currently for concerts for a cause um, at the Northside Community Church. Please join me in welcoming our ensemble today. Good afternoon. I will focus today on the Czech composer Pavel Haas, namesake of the Pavel Haas String Quartet, while my colleague Caroline Helton will widen the topic to include Jewish composers elsewhere in Europe. We will shed some light on who these figures were, what their music was like, and what role music played for them in the darkest hours of history. On the one hand, I am amazed that it, it has taken more than 50 years for these composers to receive some of the international attention they deserve. While on the other hand, when we consider the condition of Europe after World War II, followed by the Iron Curtain and the communists labeling of these composers as decadent, their unique musical styles could only be stifled. And these styles were indeed unique voices that together make up an exciting, vital school of musical expression between the world wars that was sadly cut short. Pavel Haas was born in 1899 into a wealthy and prominent Jewish family in the, the Moravian capital of Brno. Still a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Brno was known more by its German name, Brünn. The Brno Music Conservatory was founded by Brno's leading international figure, composer Leos Janáček. And Pavel Haas was Janáček's most promising and illustrious pupil. Haas studied with Janáček from 1920 to 22, shortly after Czechoslovakia became a country in 1918. So, you can see Brno is right here. This is Czechoslovakia soon after 1918. Uh, later we'll be talking about uh, Terezin, which became a concentration camp, and that's right around here near Usti nad Labem. And you'll see how very close Terezin is to the border, and you'll learn why pretty soon. The new Czechoslovakia was a thriving, exciting democratic country, boasting the fifth largest economy in the world, and Brno itself was a city with a rich cultural life. Haas absorbed many musical trends of the time, including jazz, stylistic traits from his teacher, Leos Janáček, and neoclassicism from the influential giant, Igor Stravinsky, all infused with elements of folk music from his native Moravia, as well as elements of Hebrew chant. The voice was very unique, pure Pavel Haas, and by the 1930s, he had developed into a mature composer. The 1930s was a golden age for Czech cinema, and one of its leading figures was Pavel Haas's brother, Hugo Haas. Hugo Haas starred in and directed classic Czech comedies that are still frequently aired on Czech television. A versatile composer, Pavel Haas wrote film music for several of his brother's movies. In 1935, Pavel Haas married Sonia Jakobson, the former wi wife of the legendary Russian linguist Roman Jakobson. In 1937, Pavel Haas and his wife had a baby daughter, Olga. By 1940, Pavel Haas had written several outstanding works, such as the Piano Suite and the Three String Quartets. Number two will be heard this evening in Rackham Auditorium with the Pavel Haas Quartet. 
A great triumph was his opera Charlatan, the Charlatan, written to Haas's own Czech libretto. It was premiered in Brno in 1938 to great acclaim and won the country's Smetana Foundation Award, sharing this esteemed prize with Czech female composer Vítězslava Kapralová. Because of the Nazi occupation of Czechoslovakia that year, further performances of Charlatan were banned, ending plans for a production in Prague. It was not heard again until 1997 in a concert version in Prague that I was very privileged to attend. Wexford Festival Opera staged it the following year and it has been recorded on the DECA label. The music is wonderful. It is colorful, filled with rhythmic energy, and it is immediately engaging, charming, and witty, while at the same time sophisticated and profound. This description of the music that I just gave is much like the man himself, as quoted by musicologist Ludwig Kundera. Quote, everyone knew Haas as always a smiling, witty, and slightly ironic companion. But at the same time, his frail figure and pale face added to his humorous words a hint of sadness, as if he had a foreboding of the tragedy of his destiny and of the bitter end of his, his life. Soon, Haas's activities in Brno were completely restricted. In secret, he wrote his Suite for Oboe and Piano, a powerful and defiant work that is obviously indicative of his troubling situation. This was followed by the charming and beautiful set of seven songs in folk style, which show no hint of adversity. One work then expressed his outrage, while the other served as a loving tribute to his country and a temporary escape from his feudal situation. Both types of musical outlets were to play key roles in the lives of the prisoners of Terezin. A major work from this period, a large symphony, was begun in 1940 and left unfinished in 1941. It was completed by a Czech musicologist many years after Haas's death and premiered in 1994. It too has been recorded with outstanding reviews. As the situation for Jews in Czechoslovakia worsened, Haas tried frantically to obtain visas out of the country, even contacting distant relatives of his wife's from the United States, but all to no avail. Haas's wife, was not Jewish, and like many couples of the time, Haas divorced his wife in order for her and their daughter to be exempt from the Nazis' laws. They did survive, and their daughter Olga went on to become a prominent actress in Brno. She is now 75 years old. Pavel's brother, Hugo Haas, was able to escape the German occupation and made his way to Hollywood where he acted in quite a few films, including Days of Glory with Gregory Peck, and on television, including an episode of Bonanza, if you remember Bonanza. <laughs> he died in 1968. Pavel Haas, however, was sent to Terezin, known in German as Theresienstadt, in November 1941, as part of the first Jewish transport sent there. Terezin was built as a walled fortress in 1780 by Emperor Joseph II of Austria and named after his mother, Empress Maria Theresa. Its purpose was to protect the Austro-Hungarian Empire from Prussian attacks. After 1882, Terezin was no longer used as a fortress and it developed into a town of 7,000 Czech inhabitants. 7,000. The Nazis evacuated the residents and turned the impenetrable fortress town into a concentration camp occupied by mostly Jewish artists, musicians, scientists, and scholars. 
Between 35,000 and 60,000 Jewish prisoners occupied the small space, and more than 33,000 died there of disease or starvation. Terezin also became a way station for prisoners throughout Europe on their way to execution in Auschwitz and other camps. 140,000 Jews, 17,000 of them children, passed through Terezin on their way to one of these death camps. Some of the many musicians in Terezin included the Czech composers Gideon Klein, Viktor Ullmann, and Hans Krasa, as well as the opera singer Karel Berman and conductors Karel Ancherl and Rudolf Schechter. All of these I mentioned perished in Auschwitz except for the singer Karel Berman and conductor Karel Ancel. According to the few survivors, Rudolf Schechter played a truly transformative role in the lives of the prisoners. He eased their suffering and despondency by having them sing. Performances of the Czech national opera, The Bartered Bride, became a means of escape and a defiant tribute to their native land. Most important were his performances of Verdi's Requiem with camp instrumentalists and singers, more than 15 performances. <coughs> For the Nazis, their singing of the Requiem was foolish, but Schechter told the inmates, quote, we can sing to them what we cannot say to them. Going on, he said, in the Dies Irae, we will sing to them of the day of wrath that is prophesied, that the trumpets shall summon them before the throne to be accountable, and nothing, nothing shall remain unavenged. When the damned are assigned to the searing flames, call us to the blessed, we shall sing. End of quote. A survivor described the experience. What a rejuvenating and hopeful experience it was. This music was not merely nourishing, but consuming. Listening was not the normal and usual option, but no option, an absolute necessity. End of quote. You can learn more by reading the book, The Terezin Requiem, by Josef Bohr, B-O-R, a survivor of the camp. It's, it's available on Amazon. Similarly, the children's opera, Brundjebar, the Bumblebee, was performed at Terezin 55 times under the direction of Schechter and its composer, Hans Krasa. Sung by children, it had been composed in 1938 and performed in Prague in secret. Children are victorious over evil in this opera. At Terezin, the figure of evil was easily recognized among the inmates as Hitler, a symbolism lost on the German guards who did not speak Czech. It must be noted that both the Requiem and Brundibar had to be continually rehearsed with new performers, performers as they were sent to Auschwitz. Another great composer who was to perish at Auschwitz was Viktor Ullmann. His opera, Der Kaiser von Atlantis, set to German words, was actually composed in Terezin, but never fully performed there. Rehearsals were promptly squelched when the guards realized that the Kaiser of the title was Hitler. This great one-act opera is performed frequently today. In Ann Arbor, only last month, in an all-student production. It is powerful, moving, and even affirmative in its embracing of death as a necessary part of life. Ullmann wrote, quote, all that I would stress is that Theresienstadt has helped, not hindered me, in my musical work that we certainly did not sit down by the waters of Babylon and weep, and that our desire for culture was a match for our desire for life. 
Yet another great musical figure in the camp was the composer and pianist Gideon Klein, whose positive energy quickly reinvigorated the frail and despondent Pavel Haas when he first arrived there. Haas is known to have written eight works in Terezin. Three survive. They are Alsfot, Hebrew for Do Not Lament, for male chorus, to words of David Shimoni, the study for strings, and the four songs on Chinese poetry. A performance of the study for strings at Terezin, conducted by Karel Anchel, can be heard and seen on YouTube in a Nazi propaganda film made in 1944. This is a clip from the, from the film. Uh, that's Pavel Haas taking a bow and Karl Anchel up on the podium. Um, this propaganda film had its origins in a trip by the Red Cross demanded by the Danish government. For this trip, the Nazis had quickly deported the most elderly and sick pr prisoners, spruced up the camp, and created storefronts, playgrounds, and a seemingly thriving community. Since the Red Cross tour was successful, they hatched the idea of creating a film they could distribute to dispel any rumors from the outside world. As soon as the film was finished, deportations began again at an increased level. Karl Anchel survived Auschwitz, becoming a legendary conductor whose work can be heard on many recordings. He credited Haas for saving his life. When arriving in Auschwitz, prisoners were sorted into two lines, one line for those to be executed and one line for workers. Haas and Anchel came up together, and at first, Anchel was put in the line to be killed while Haas was chosen to be a worker. When Haas began coughing, they were switched. Anchel always thought Haas had coughed on purpose. Karl Anchel later returned to Terezin and found the orchestral parts for the study for strings, programming them throughout his career. Pavel Haas wrote the four songs on Chinese poetry for a fellow inmate who requested them, the 25-year-old bass, Karel Bermann, and they, um, they were performed by Bermann and Rudolf Schechter in the camp four months before being sent to Auschwitz. Bermann survived Auschwitz, Dachau, and the Death March, becoming an esteemed opera singer, opera director, and professor of voice in Prague. He died in 1995. The four songs are set to Czech translations of Chinese poetry that deal with love and mostly a longing to return home. The songs are unified by a motive of four notes that come from a 12th century Czech chorale, the Wenzlas or Václav chorale, shown here. Good King Wenzlas reigned in the 10th century in Prague, and after being murdered by order of his ambitious brother, Boleslav, he was proclaimed a saint. For centuries up to the present, Saint Václav has served as the symbol of Czech statehood. The chorale has been quoted by quite a few Czech composers in their works, including other works of Pavel Haas. The four notes come from the word Václave. You can see here. Those four notes there. We hear this in the piano at the very beginning of the first song. When the singer enters, he sings these same notes on the words domov yetan, home is there. So as the poet longs for home in these songs by Haas, we know clearly where that home lies. Alan Schrott 
And I would now like to perform the first song, I Heard the Sound of Wild Geese. Actually, this will give me an opportunity to introduce my program. I'm a, I'm a singer, which is what I teach and, and, and how I perform. My presentation will consist mostly of singing with introductions of the pieces by these different composers. Um, and here's how I begin. Through their state-sanctioned persecution, the Nazis attempted to silence some of the most gifted voices in their artistic world. Their stories are unique, as are their compositions, and some have gone largely unheard due to the success of the Nazi suppression of their art. In this program, I seek to tell the stories of these individuals and let their unique voices be heard. The first piece on the program is by one of the most significant and highly educated Italian composers of his generation, Mario Castelnuovo Tedesco. A student of Ildebrando Pizzetti, one can hear the influence of French Impressionism in his sumptuous harmonic writing. Castanova Tedesco emigrated to the United States in 1939, where, like many other prominent Jewish composers who escaped the Holocaust, he made his living as a professional composer of film music. For decades, this vocalise étude was believed to be lost until Italian musicologist Professor Aloma Bardi discovered a copy while doing research in the U.S. Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And so this piece, being a vocalise, is only sung on vowels, so we won't have any translations. <laughs> <coughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Thank you. Robert Kahn is arguably the most obscure composer on our program today. Kahn's father was a well-to-do well businessman in Mannheim, and Robert began, began life with many material advantages and full parental support for his musical education. As a young man, he was able to meet and impress Johannes Brahms, and the two composers spent a few years in close contact toward the end of Brahms's life. Kahn was a successful composer, teacher, conductor, and collaborative pianist, and his compositions are dominated by chamber music, piano compositions, songs, and choral works. He served on the faculty of the Royal Conservatory of Music in Berlin and was also appointed to the Prussian Academy of the Arts. In 1934, despite his well-respected position and success as composer and performer, Kahn was forced by the Nazis to resign his post and forbidden to perform in public or to publish his compositions. At that point, he went into what he called an internal exile to his home outside of Berlin. In early 1939, however, at the age of 73, he and his wife made the decision to emigrate to England, where he continued to compose prolifically until his death in 1951. Catherine and I will be performing an early song by Kahn, Der Gärtner, in which the composer displays his conservative yet expressive style. of the Austrian composer Erich Korngold reads like a movie script, which is ironic, considering his role as a pioneer of the symphonic film score. He was a true child prodigy, producing his first opera in Vienna at the age of 12. As 1938 approached, the situation in Europe was deteriorating, and there was an atmosphere of mounting apprehension concerning the future of Austria, especially among Jews. On January 22, 1938, Korngold received a telegram from Warner Brothers asking him if he could come to Hollywood in 10 days to start work on a new film, The Adventures of Robin Hood. And in fact, here, um, Korngold on, our, on the right is conduct conducting Basil Rathbone, who was in that movie. Basil Rathbone was one of the main actors for Warner Brothers at the time. Interpreting this invitation as an omen, he accepted the offer and the Korngolds left Austria on January 25th. They arrived in Hollywood on February 7th and Hitler's army marched into Austria on March 13th. The rest of Korngold's family was lucky enough to leave Austria on the last unrestricted train out of Vienna and to cross into Switzerland on the last day this was allowed, eventually joining Korngold in Hollywood, but leaving all their worldly possessions behind. Unvergänglichkeit was composed in 1934, but not premiered until 1937. As it so happens, the concert featuring this song was Korngold's last premiere in Vienna before the war. 
Korngold's music immediately conjures the sound world equivalent of Gustav Klimt with its shimmering harmonies and sensual melodies. Vittorio Rieti was internationally renowned as a composer and emigrated to the United States from France in 1940. He traveled widely, spending as much time in Paris as he did in Rome in the years before the war, where he befriended Stravinsky and the members of Les Six, whose influence can be heard in the following song, in which he chose to set poetry by French poet and painter Max Jacob. Jacob was friends with many of the prominent artists and writers living in Paris in the early 20th century, such as Picasso, Braque, and Guillaume Apollinaire. Because Jacob was Jewish, he spent much of the war in hiding, but was arrested by the Gestapo in 1944. During his imprisonment, before, before he was to be transported to a concentration camp in Germany, Jacob died of bronchial pneumonia in the French internment camp of Drancy. In La Crise, you can hear Rieti's sense of humor, much in the style of Poulenc, as he sets Jacob's absurd surrealist text.
1933, just two weeks after the Nazi party came to power, Kurt Weil, who was the son of a cantor and composer, saw the writing on the wall, and he and his wife, Lotte Lenya, gathered their belongings in two suitcases and went into exile in France. Once there, Weil met and collaborated with French composers and playwrights, including Darius Millot, a Jewish composer who emigrated to the U.S. in 1939. One of his projects was to write incidental music for a play called Marie Galante, and in 1934, Weil wrote the Tango Habanera that later became the song Yucali. In 1946, he added the words by Roger Fernet, of which the main themes are longing, the search for a land of happiness, a place where one can leave all one's cares behind, where people respect each other's vows, and disillusionment. It is a dream. There is no Yukali. One can imagine this was how Kurt Weil felt when he left his native country behind. I also find it telling that he chose a French text for this song as if leaving his native language behind as well. He had to find a new voice, which he resourcefully continued to reinvent after his eventual emigration to the United States in 1935 until his death in 1950. And this song will conclude our program.
I would like to say a few words, first of all. Many thanks to Professor Cheek and all performers. Uh, I would like to say something more about the resin, uh, something which uh, can explain the cultural life there, both the authentic and both the under the pressure of Germans. Theresien was not a concentration camp, not extermination camp. Theresien was a gathering place where Jews from all Europe were concentrated and their way waiting for the transport. Transport were leaving every day and nobody knew which transport will be her or his. Uh, the part of Terezin was a prison, small part of Terezin was a prison of Prague Gestapo. My father was a prisoner of that prison. He survived. He, were, he was transported to Dachau and in May 45 liberated by American army. That's all. Thank you all very much uh, for your great uh, presentation today. Um, in this place in uh, northwestern, Czech uh, yeah, northwestern Czechoslovakia, um, is there any uh, truth to uh, what has sometimes been said that those who uh, performed or sang uh, in that way station or concentration camp uh, were treated better than, uh, let's say, others who did not uh, do such things? Mm -hmm. That I, sure. I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that. Um, I did read um, um, the, the way the, the Nazis set it up. Um, they arranged that there was a council of elders uh, who had better quarters, and they gave them the job of deciding who would be transported. So whatever that did, to the morale of everyone involved, I don't know. You, know, I you can only imagine. How many languages can you sing in? <laughs> Me? Uh, whichever language for which people like Professor Cheek provide the, the transcription. <laughs> <laughs> I, I happen. I all singers study languages. I happen to speak Italian and German along with my Appalachian Mountain English, and um, and I've studied French as well. But I've sung in Czech, Swedish, oh lordy, Estonian. That's probably I've sung in Estonian and Spanish and Russian, and so we we are required to sing in a lot of languages. Um, thanks. Th this thing is on, right? Yeah. Thanks so much for those. It's such a wonderful performance. Um, I have a question, especially for Caroline and Catherine, on, about the, the songs that we heard, the, the last little sort of bouquet of songs that we heard. I am not a music specialist. Um, to, to my ears, I thought that there was a, 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 there were qualities of theatricality and, and just a real sort of a vividness, a sense of, of expressiveness in those songs, mm -hmm. which is maybe absolutely typical of you know choral music of the first half of the 20th century, or maybe is typical of music music that was written by people who shared the kinds of experiences that um, we heard about today. I wonder if you could, for those of us, especially for those of us who were not you know, that fluent in, in music, um, and in 20th century music in particular, if you could maybe talk a little bit about that quality of the music? I would say it's absolutely uh, typical of, of art song, uh, because vocal music, uh, when you sing, 
especially when you're not in an opera where there's, you know, a stage and a set and a costume and everything, the singer is expected to evoke dramatically what is happening in the whole composition. And so the composition itself is meant to be a, a, a dramatic experience just sort of on an intimate scale. So, yeah, I would say that all that all the composers, all com well, certainly the composers of that time period are very attuned to the dramatic elements of their music. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say so? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty typical. All right. Do you know about the other movies of Eric Korngold? Didn't his Robin Hood win a... Uh, didn't uh, Robin Hood win a... Uh, I, 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 I think, yeah, won an Academy Award. He did a Midsummer Night's Dream. He did... Uh, my daughter and I watched all of these Warner Brother movies. Uh, what was the one? Oh, shoot. Captain Blood. He did Captain Blood. Um, can you remember any of the other ones we watched? Um, the the Prince and the Pauper. All he was like the main composer for Warner Brothers all through those Basil Rathbone, Errol Flynn years. Wow. So that Errol Flynn was my. I think she was seven at the time. That was my daughter's favorite actor. Because we. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned, uh, or Mr. Cheek, Professor Cheek mentioned. Um, in the very beginning that Pavel Haas incorporated Hebrew chants into his music. And Kurt Weil was the son of a cantor. And I wondered if you could say more about the incorporation of Jewish religious music into these works during this period. Wow. I can't go into details exactly. Um, it's just that, that it became part of the musical fabric that um, it's also infused with other elements, yeah. you know, to, to give a really personal voice to, to this, this composer. Um, so what you have are, are general trends of the time, like neoclassicism and some late romanticism, and, and your pieces are French, um, um, international elements, and then you have local elements, in Pavel Haas's case, Moravian folk music. And then you have the more personal elements, too, as the Hebrew chant. And it was just part of who the person was. And that's, that's why I think if you, if you really want to know what a composer is all about, for almost, for almost every composer, you look at their vocal music, you look at the words that they chose to set, and then you see what the music is like. And then you get a really good picture of the times, the place, and of the person himself. Um, so specifically about Hebrew chant, I just, I, not really qualified to, to talk about that, but that, that it's all part of the fabric. Mm -hmm. I've, I've got a little more information about that because I also have a lot of different composers to, um, to draw from here. but. Normally, or rather, com Jewish composers were so assimilated into the fabric of, of the art music of the time that, um, like like Professor Cheek said, there, there are lots of different elements that go into their music. And so um, I find that they rarely drew on actual liturgical chant uh, in their pieces. However, um, Kurt Weil, early on in his life, wrote some pieces that were intended for performance in the synagogue. Um, or, and he also wrote pieces on, on texts by uh, Yehuda HaLevi and those things. He chose Jewish themes for some of his pieces. Pieces. But normally these composers um, were, were so integrated that they tended not to, not to choose a lot of that, except for Darius Mio. He included a lot of he, uh, texts that had to do with Zionism and Judaism, and um, he was probably one of the most proudly identified Jewish composers. Uh, and in fact, on the the group of songs that I sang, the that's the only thing that Casanova Tedesco ever wrote that uh, for art music consumption that had any kind of Jewish title was the one I just sang. Um, but he also wrote uh, a whole Shabbat liturgy 
service that was used in, in Schultz. Huh? You know, we're more familiar with the works of those artists who were fortunate enough to escape uh, Europe uh, at that time. But I'm, you know, I'm wondering, um, has there been any concerted effort to find the works of those artists who died in Theresen or the other camps? Um, you mentioned some works that have been found only fairly recently. Can you speak to that? Um, for Terezin, th there has been a lot going on uh, with that, and quite a few recordings of uh, Terezin composers, um, w which is wonderful. I just, you know, wish it hadn't taken so long. Um, other composers, it's starting starting to happen now. Um, there are a couple of other Czech composers, I can't remember their names, who were in other camps um, who perished. And we are starting to look at their music, too, now. If you Google, just Google Terezin music or composers, you'll see a lot will come up. Thanks so much for these wonderful performances. And I had a question for the performers, actually, about the act of performing itself. And um, there, I noticed there is a record called The Voices of the Holocaust, which is such a striking um, image. And it, um, it seems like it might be a different sort of musical experience for you. And so I was wondering if you could speak to what it's like to perform voices from the Holocaust, to perform music from this time, as opposed to other sorts of performances that you do. Yeah, I was rehearsing with Alan Schrott, and he had this wonderful interpretation that, that came up. Can you say a few words about that? Well, I, just specifically to what I had said to Tim was I was trying to find a kind of a personal framework for the one song that he and I did this afternoon. And what really worked for me, based on the poem and the music, and also just the the circumstances under which they were written was to think of it as something that is sad, but which can't seem overtly sad, and which is also angry, but cannot seem overtly angry. And so <clears throat> there's something roiling underneath what is basically a fairly placid texture. You know, and I don't know if, you know, we, Tim and I have rehearsed that song a fair amount. You heard it just the once, but I don't know if you remember, there's kind of an outburst. <clears throat> towards the end, and, it, and it's interesting because the text for that outburst is simply, uh, I saw a flock of wild geese fly by, right? Not usually something you would, <laughs> would exclaim, <laughs> but, but, I think, but I think if you look at what's happening and, and if you permit yourself to attach some biography of the composer to all that, that there's this, this simple, picture of nature and freedom and something that is probably headed towards home and it all just kind of erupts you know in a second and then right back to these very subtle allusions to the Wenceslas tune and, and things like that so I mean I think I think as a performer you can never afford to get too swept up in the actual emotion of things because it actually compromises what you're doing you have to you have to allow the audience that experience but I think in the, the hours when you're working on it, um, those, are the, those are the details and the things and the experiences and the personal emotions that give you the angle into a song so that you can present it clearly for other people. I don't know if that's a helpful that's answer. Right. Or not. Um, my, I feel like the, the main uh, difference that, you know, besides being really connected to the the importance that I feel uh, for this work because it's such gorgeous, great music. It's like, like Professor Cheek said, you get to know who these people are. It's like visiting with the coolest lost relative that, you know, uh, you, you really get a window into th their emotions and the time period and their aesthetic and uh, you, you just, you, you get to, to form a connection with these people that is, uh, because of their obscurity, you feel like, that's my friend, you know. Um, so uh, it, it feels a, a, like a very important thing to be able to do. Um, I just wanted to add one thing. Um, 
been wonderful being part of this great um, afternoon performance. But Caroline is really the steam and the brain work and the energy behind this project, and I've had the great honor and privilege of just coming along for the ride, sort of. And I have to say, in the beginning, the, the title, Voices of the Holocaust, which struck you, I was a little worried about that. I thought, well, maybe that's too strong um, to always use as the title, and, and it might turn some people off. Maybe I was a little embarrassed about it or something, but I have grown to embrace that title, my own self. Caroline was always convinced and stood by it, <laughs> and I'm glad she did. Uh, but I've grown to think that, to understand that it's, um, even though the actual pieces are not always, and perhaps not even most of the time about the Holocaust. They are voices that were silenced by that period. And so one thing we talk about is I always feel like when a song is being introduced, I think it was the Khan song. It's about this little gardener, and it's really happy. And, and she finished, in, on Sunday when she was going through the notes, she finished by saying, and then he died in the concentration camp. And it just felt odd to start this happy song. So I was to keep both in mind the, um, the tragic and darker elements of the life, but then also remember what they were actually looking for in this particular song and, and trying to honor both of those. And basically, it's, it's just all full of emotion, all sorts, which makes it that much richer. I, think I have one other thing to add to that. Is the one thing I really came to learn, it, Tim and I originally learned and performed those four Chinese songs of Pavel Haas 10, 12 years ago, I think. And I, I did some research around them. And I, I think I, I, that was around the time where I came to realize that I think, in my own opinion, this is not a scholarly statement, but just an opinion, I, I think Czech music was perhaps the most profoundly affected by that period because it was astoundingly rich. And if, if you come into music, and even if you study music for years, you, you often can go without much exposure to Czech music at all because it was. It was like Paris, you know, it was just exploding with interesting things and then, you know, the hammer came down and so much of it just disappeared completely. So more than French music or even, I think, Russian music or other things, it hasn't come down as directly. So I think one of the real touchstones for me just working on these songs with Tim was just gaining that interest in Czech music and realizing, especially from that time, how much of it is there, how much there is to hear. It's fairly incredible to me. Okay. Our, now, our performers and presenters have sung for their supper, and I feel strongly that we have to make good on our promise. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, suggest that we move this and, and continue the conversation casually over at the luncheon that's just outside those doors, okay? Let's thank our performers one last time. Thank you.